please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, His Excellency, and my very good friend, Yusuf al Otaiba. Welcome, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, thank you. Let me start by saying we appreciate the time you've given us, and, and let's just jump in. You were the architect of the Abraham Accords. You've been a key advocate for better relations regionally and globally. If you could give us a little of the history that led to this momentous event and what prompted you, prompted you to drive this forward, everyone would like to hear your, your views in the background, please. Appreciate it. Leon, thank you very much for having me. A pleasure to be with everyone from the Shalva world. Uh, it's a real honor. First, I think being uh, termed the architect of the Abraham Accords is a bit overly generous. Uh, this was literally a case where it took an entire village. Uh, some of us had to kind of coax the village and push the village and move the village in certain directions at certain points. But it really was a team effort. And I think a lot of people are responsible for the success of the Abraham Accords. But the backdrop was really easy, and it was very straightforward. A debate ensued in the summer of last year uh, about annexation. And I felt annexation was going to have really harmful effects on the region, on some of our friends, particularly in Jordan. But it's going to have an adverse reaction in, this, in our part of the world and therefore is going to have an adverse reaction on how the U.S. is seen in our part of the world. And so we were trying to find ways to avert annexation. We wanted to work more with Israel. We've been being more overt in our work with Israel even before the Abraham Accords. For those who were paying attention, you saw more overt examples of Israeli athletes participating in tournaments, visits, uh, an expo, a pavilion at the expo that's coming up in October, you saw all these things happening in front of your own eyes. And I felt that annexation was going to put those things at risk. It was going to be harder to have more of this cooperation with Israel in the public sphere. So what we were trying to do is trying to find a win-win formula the, to avoid annexation. And after we wrote an article in the Israeli media in about mid-June of 2019, where we very said explicitly, very explicitly said, guys, be careful, think carefully. Be cautious, be careful, because if you go down one path, you're going to risk the other one. And that's ultimately how the, the negotiations for uh, the Abraham Accords really began. We tried to find a way to avert it. That is a win-win. So we traded no annexation for normalization. And as soon as it happened, you saw the excitement, the enthusiasm, the openness. People were really generally enthused. And to prove my point, three other countries followed suit. It wasn't just about the UAE. I think the floodgates opened, people saw the benefit, and I think, you know, the, we're going to see how far we can take this relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, we all recently witnessed the UAE's first Mars mission with the landing of the Hope probe on Mars and have enjoyed seeing the pictures of the red planet a first for the Arab world, and I might add, I believe you beat the California Institute of Technology to Mars as well. Can you share with us the background in the choice and significance of the name HOPE for this mission? I think it was about four or five years ago, I was talking to a senior government official in the UAE, and he was telling me or sharing with me kind of his philosophy on what we in government should be doing. He's a very senior guy, and so I was listening attentively, and he said, you know, we in government, we're in the business of creating hope. I said, what do you mean? He said, we are in the business of creating hope, whether you're an investor, whether you're a government official, whether you're a tourist. People have to come here and feel that, you know, there is a better opportunity for them, and there is going to be a better future for them. And I've never heard the government sector articulated that way. And so I think this is a standard or consistent philosophy in how we think about things in the Emirates, whether it's a space program and a trip to Mars, or whether it's our you know, efforts to contain and deal with the COVID pandemic or climate change. I think we are in the business of trying to create hope and trying to send a positive message out of a region that's always seen as either negative or violent or tense or unstable. I think if you ask your average American, 
what's your first impression or your first thought when you think of the Middle East, uh, they're going to think turmoil, violence, religion, terrorism. That, that word bubble would be a very negative word bubble. So we try to do the opposite. We try to send positive messages, what it is about peace in the Abraham Accords, Mars and going into space with the Hope Probe, or even welcoming the Pope for the first time in the Arabian Peninsula. We want people in the Emirates and people outside of the Emirates to think that you can have a successful model in the region, that you can work towards a better future and have people buy in and invest in it. And that's very important for us. This is who we are. It's our values. So I think it's the name Hope is a, is a no-brainer given kind of how we see and how we like to operate as a government and as a country and as a society. Mr. Ambassador, I, I have one word to say, amen. Thank you so much for that. Uh, another question, a little bit, I think, more difficult in that, what do you see the future of additional Arab states signing agreements with Israel? And do you think the change of administration has affected that? I, I don't think the administration affects it because any country that wants to normalize with Israel will make, will make that decision based on their calculations, on their criteria, on their politics, on ultimately what's good for them or if it's not good for them. So I, I think the administration can help and encourage and support, which I'm sure they will. Uh, but any country who is thinking of this, they have to go through their mental checklist, whether it makes sense for them politically whether it makes sense for them economically, whether they have the internal political public support for something like this. And each country is going to vary. They're all different answers. There's no standard answer for any of this. But at the end of the day, the reason I think, let's just talk about the UAE-Israel relationship for a second. The reason I think this is going to be successful is because it's in our mutual interest. It is good for the UAE. It's good for Israel. If you open the aperture of the trade investment and research and all the things that we are going, we're going to do together that are exemplified by what, what Shalva is doing with the Emirates, this is a win-win. There's no reason not to do this. We've, came to that, we've come to that conclusion a while ago. And so if we can cooperate on climate, on COVID, on space, on research, on healthcare, this is absolutely the right thing to do. Each country has to come to that conclusion on its own and decide that this is ultimately in their country's national interest. We made that con we've made that assessment a while ago. I think it's up to others to do it on their own time. Thank you. Uh, I understand, Youssef, you've never been to Israel, but hopefully post-COVID are planning a trip soon. Have you thought about, of course, after your visit to Shalva, yeah. what else you would like to see when you go to Israel? I really haven't thought about it because there's so much I want to see. I have a lot of friends there, so I haven't really begun to even mentally plan my trip. Um, but I just want to see a country that I've never been able to visit in my life. It's, it's, there's this kind of uncharted territory thing to it where, hey, I was never allowed to go. Now I'm allowed to go. I want to see what it looks like. So I'm excited to go, but there's two things I'm trying to avoid in Israel. One is COVID and two is Israeli politics. So, so once those two things are out of the way, I'll plan my visit. Thank you. I think everyone agrees, and I look forward to visiting Dubai. Before the last question, Mr. Ambassador, I want to thank you again on behalf of all of Shalva. Uh, for the last question, I'd like to refer to former Secretary of State George Shultz, who recently passed away after an historic career. In 2004, I had the honor of hosting Secretary of Schultz at a conference. At that time, the last question asked of the secretary was, Mr. Secretary, how would you like history to remember you and what would you like your legacy to be? And the secretary talked a lot about creating democracies, freedom, better life, and have you said, hope for millions of people. Yusuf, our dear friend, who has accomplished so much and, God willing, has decades more to go, I would ask the same question of you. How would you like history to describe your legacy? First, I would like history to not make it about me. I would love history to make sure that the accomplishment itself is, is evaluated on merit. 
And for me, the part I'm most excited about, the part that I'm most, that I think will have the biggest impact and breakthrough on our part of the world is increasing and enhancing understanding between our people. I'm sure we're going to do a lot of trade and investment. I'm sure people are going to make money. I'm sure jobs are going to be created. I have no doubt in any of that. But the most important part is that a young Israeli is going to find out very soon that people in the Emirates have absolutely nothing against him and vice versa. People in the Emirates are going to start believing and understanding that Israelis don't have anything against them. To me, that's the most important part. And it sounds cliche, and I know it sounds like it's a bumper sticker, but it's really not. I'll give you my own personal example of why I feel strongly about this, Leon. As I told you before, I grew up in Egypt. I was born and raised in Egypt. My mother is Egyptian, my wife is Egyptian, and anyone who's been to Egypt, who has known someone from Egypt, they know that we grow up programmed, programmed to hate Israel. We are programmed that Israel is the enemy. Before you can understand why, before you can start to rationalize, it is part of the DNA. Israel is the enemy. So I grew up that way. The best part about this is my 10-year-old son is not going to grow up that way. He is going to grow up thinking it is totally normal to go to Israel. It is totally normal to trade and do business. It's totally normal to do a research project with an Israeli student. That's what I think the region needs more of. I really think we need to get out of our ideological, uh, you know, handcuffs and limitations and start to think a little more openly. Look, we can still have political disagreements. Just because we have normalized and made peace with Israel doesn't mean we agree on everything. We're going to have tough conversations about some issues. But it means I can work with you and disagree with you at the same time. It means I don't have to demonize you or alienate you. It means that we're breaking a taboo that is only going to foster more, more understanding and more respect for each other. I mean, you can talk about it, Leon, but you know, tell me what Shalva's board's experience so far with the Ministry of Community Development was like. We started off from scratch. These guys didn't know each other. But in how long have we, how long did it take us to make progress? And that's the kind of thing I want the legacy to be. We created an opening for more understanding in the region. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your vision. We all look forward in the coming years to work together to create hope, accomplishment, and a better life for Israel, the Emirates, the region, and as broad as we can take your beautiful vision. Thank you, Yosef, very much. Thank you, Leon. My pleasure.